Extra Historians, welcome to Lies, the part of the show where I tell you all the mistakes we made, all the things we left out, and I try to get through without uh, losing my voice. I'm sick. Uh, I'm also Rob Rath. I'm the head writer of Extra History. Uh, I didn't write this one, though. This is Cleopatra, and we got a really excellent guest writer on it uh, named Bob Whitaker. He's a history professor, and he's actually taught Cleopatra, so I thought that was a really cool match. Our recommended reading for this week is SPQR, A History of Ancient Rome by Mary Beard, When Women Ruled the World, Six Egyptian Queens by Kara Cooney, Cleopatra, A Source Book by Prudence Jones, Cleopatra's Cocktail, which is an article by Prudence Jones, Actium, 31 BC, from Osprey, written by Cy Shepard, illustrated by Krista, Cook, Krista Hook. Uh, that's one that I used to do some of the image, uh, image inspirations on this one. Uh, so yeah, this was a really cool series. A lot of you really responded to it well and uh, really liked us talking about historical memory. If that's something that you would like us to do more, maybe we'll, maybe we'll do a little more of that. It's a big part of uh, modern historical scholarship is not only looking at an event specifically or a person specifically, but looking how images of that changed uh, throughout time. So not just Elizabeth I of England, but what the Victorians thought of Elizabeth I versus uh, what people in the early 20th century thought of Elizabeth I, and seeing how that uh, changes and what it tells us about society at different points in time. I really liked that we can get into historical memory in this series. It's the thing that Bob most wanted to do. And uh, unfortunately, we had to f save it for episode five, but that's, uh, I'm really proud of that episode. So let's just talk a little bit about uh, general questions people had. Heracles, could you go more into the Ptolemy family tree? You skipped over a lot of the intrigue in politics, uh, like Tol Ptolemy II, who sponsored the construction of the Library of Alexandria, as well as Ptolemy's conflicts with the Seleucids for control of the Middle East that lasted several generations. There's a lot of interesting stuff about the Ptolemies, but because we needed to focus on Cleopatra and we wanted to do this one episode that was totally on the historical memory of Cleopatra, we couldn't do too much with the Ptolemies. We could do uh, a, a series on the Ptolemies. I've actually been wanting to do a series on the Library of Alexandria for a while. I think that would be a really good kind of entrance point uh, to talk, talking about the rest of the Ptolemies. There's a lot of cool history there. Um, we didn't have time to do it in the series. I kind of don't really have to do it now because that's a very expensive, expansive topic. Um, and I'm going to try and get through this without losing my voice. I have strep or tonsillitis or something. Um, so next, uh, there are a lot of folks that wanted to know about Arsinoe, Cleopatra's half-sister. She's an interesting figure. Uh, so when Caesar comes, she escapes Alexandria. She meets up with the generals who are controlling the Egyptian army, lays siege to Alexandria uh, with Cleopatra inside. Uh, Caesar actually makes a strike for the lighthouse uh, of Alexandria and um, ends up being defeated there. Uh, so that's that's a pretty pretty neat thing. You know, she's on one side and Caesar's on the other, and she wins. Um, not ultimately, she ends up being uh, escorted in the triumph. And uh, by the way, with a model of the uh, Pharos lighthouse of Alexandria on fire. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a neat thing. Um, maybe she'll write a one-off it, one-off episode at some point. Um, episode one, patron questions. Uh, Marina de Mora said, from episode one and discussing the Ptolemy's incest streak, I, I want to comment that with all the inbreeding, uh, load Cleopatra would have, it's a miracle she wasn't laden with, laden with several congenital diseases. This actually lets us talk about something else. So let's talk about how we use skin tone in this episode. So if you'll notice, the Ptolemies, we portrayed them visually as kind of with varying skin tones. And one of the things we were hinting at is that a lot of times with the Ptolemaic line, so they're Macedonian Greek, right? But we don't know frequently who was the mom in a lot of cases. And sometimes it's a little iffy who was the father. And it's just sort of assumed that, yeah, the the couple are direct siblings and are married, but apparently a lot of the children might have also uh, been the children of enslaved people in the Ptolemaic court. So when you get into these questions about like what Cleopatra looked like and was she, did she look more Macedonian Greek? Did she look more North African? It's totally possible that it would just be a very unique mix for each kid. 
in that line. Um, and that's another thing of like, why don't they have quite so many congenital diseases that we hear about? It's like, well, maybe they weren't actually the kids of uh, these direct brother-sister couples. Um, so that's that kind of puts a little wrench in our, our this thing that's come out more recently too. Uh, this has been a, something for a long time. But with the new movie, people are like, well, Gal Gadot is playing Cleopatra? Like, she doesn't look North African. She's not North African. It's like, well, the Ptolemies aren't North African, but they probably have some North African genetics in them. Uh, so it actually, we're probably never really going to know what Cleopatra truly looked like. Um, even the, the busts and statues we have of her, uh, unfortunately, the paint has degraded to a certain, to a point that we're not going to really be able to understand what color they were. Um, we have a pretty good idea of her facial structure, but then you get into what is artist's interpre interpretation. Um, we're actually not even sure a lot of the things that we use as sources are 100% actually her. Uh, so this is going to probably be a mystery for quite a while, uh, unless there's some new discovery, um, which would be very neat. Um, Vigard Bless asked, what parallels are there between the assassinations in the first episode uh, of Cleopatra and those in the third century crisis? It seems so intentional to have these series be back to back. It's not intentional. It's just what the, it's what the patrons voted for. But I really love it when people ask these kinds of questions because this is what's cool about history, like identifying theme and looking at how uh, circumstances that were similar at different times were dealt with differently or came out differently. So to me, the main difference between the Ptolemies and the third century crisis is in the Ptolemies, it's all one family. So there is a line of succession that is being followed. There's a certain self-contained nature of it rather than just like any general uh, who gets the army on his side deciding, I'm going to be emperor now, right? So there's a little bit more stability in Egypt. Um, and also... Uh, you do have this this like layer of court officials that are kind of keeping everything rolling, uh, even while all this craziness is going on at the top. Connor D asked a related question. Given that the Ptolemaic kingdom was riddled with corruption and intrigue, how did they compare to other successor states of Alexander's empire, like the Seleucids? Uh, surely a kingdom this corrupt wouldn't have fallen when it did if the other rival states weren't also in the same boat and Rome notwithstanding. I would actually say Rome is very much in the same boat. Because remember, we're talking about Julius Caesar, Octavian, Antony times. So there's there's quite a bit of political politicking and intrigue and murder going on there as well. Uh, but as we mentioned, it's all in the same family. So there's that, like a structure at least that's being followed. So it's just not total chaos. Uh, and you do have that layer of, uh, of administrators that are keeping everything kind of, the ship is sort of getting righted. Um, and all this nonsense at the top isn't, isn't quite the, like the end of the world. Um, I would say the Seleucids are in like a little bit of a different position than Egypt. Um, the Seleucids had a major geopolitical map problem in that on their Western border, they have Egypt and the Ptolemies who they're fighting all the time. On their Eastern border, they have India and, uh, the Maurya empire, which I'm, sick, so I'm not going to be able to pronounce well, um, that uh, are fighting them. They go into Greece and are getting contested there by Rome. So they have a lot of enemies surrounding them and a lot of border disputes and difficulties uh, that Ptolemaic Egypt generally avoids. Um, but even then, you know, after 164 BCE, uh, the Seleucid Empire has, has its own struggles. They end up, in, end up in a succession crisis that shrinks and shrinks and shrinks the empire until Pompey conquers and remakes the state. So they have their own, they have their own issues. Um, let's talk about the big one from this episode. So we ended up pulling this episode down and re-uploading it with a portion cut. And I want to start off by saying this was 100% my fault. Um, so when we have a guest writer, I review and edit and often insert or change the scripts. Um, but I also like to try and keep some of the voice because there's not a lot of point in having a guest writer if they don't have uh, their own specific voice. Um, and Bob used a lot of humor uh, in this series, which is great. 
I love, I love humor in history. I have a few rules about how humor has to work in extra history, though. One is that the humor can't distract from the history. Two is it should enhance the understanding of the material. Um, three is contemporary references are to be avoided because it tends to date the material. Like, for example, if we were doing uh, Majapahit and I made a joke about the Pacific Rim and involving the movie Pacific Rim, you'd be like, you know, if you watch that four years later, you're like, wow, that this is like of a time and place when this was made, right? But also they just tend to pull people out of the show. Um, and I like to keep people mentally thinking about the history. Uh, Bob originally had a joke in there that was about the, uh, he was basically, he said that, you know, when the uh, Ptolemaic rulers started adopting Egyptian dress and Egyptian customs in public and stuff, they were the first to Westerners to walk like an Egyptian. Um, and I was like, yeah, I don't, I was a little concerned that that joke referenced a song that a lot of our viewership, which can be quite young, wouldn't get. And it would just feel a little out of place. So I took it out and I inserted a joke saying that they were first in a long line of Westerners to practice cultural appropriation. I kind of intended that joke to be more of like a, if that appeared on like The Daily Show or um, uh, like a late night comedy show, people wouldn't have thought anything of it. But because it was unusual um, for our show uh, to engage in humor like that, it confused people. Um, some people understood there was a joke and just thought it was not a good joke, which it isn't actually. Um, but others thought that we were specifically arguing that, which was not. In fact, members of the crew, when we talked about it, some were like, oh no, I thought you were serious when you were saying that. I was like, no, no, it's a joke. Um, so it was confusing enough. And if I just made a bad joke and people, you know, didn't like it, I would, I would have left it up. But because it was confusing uh, people about the history and confusing what we were um, talking about, and it was confusing, uh, causing confusion about the material, we decided to pull it down, snip it out, re-upload it, and, and then talk about it in lies. Um, also, like something like that in episode one, it was going to be like over a month before we could talk about it. So we just decided that was the right thing to do. It was easy to do. Um, we're probably not going to be doing that a lot, but in this instance, it was it was fairly simple to just cut it out and not uh, and and kind of nip it in the bud. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, we appreciate that. I apologize. Um, and uh, I will try and follow my own rules more. Uh, the Pearl, we also had a comment, the pearl story is probably a myth as scientific testing shows it takes about 24 hours for even a small pearl to be dissolved. So there was a really great article by the classicist Prudence Jones uh, who has done experiments and found it is possible. Uh, now it is true that 24 to 36 hours is about what it can take for a large pearl to dissolve. Um, it's shorter if it's agitated uh, and if the vinegar is heated. But, you know, she points out that the, the person who's talking, who's recording this, um, didn't necessarily like see this event and probably the time is being compressed when it's being retold, right? It might be that like, all right, no, I, I uh, she might not have taken it off her ear and like dropped it in the cup. Like that's the story as it's presented, but probably it was uh, prepared in advance. Uh, the, uh, there are other instances of pearl drinking in this period. And it's always talked about like this concoction is, is prepared before, uh, about the day before, but Prudence Jones also found out that if you crush the pearl and put it into boiling vinegar, it only takes about 10 minutes for it to dissolve. So it's actually pretty possible. They could have just like, you know, done like wheeled up the, the cart, like you'd, do like a flaming dessert or something like that and like did the pearl uh, cocktail preparation. So it is possible, but it's gross, it's super gross. <laughs> she makes that very clear in the article. Uh, saying Alexander didn't have any heirs is technically correct. He did have a son who was born two months after he died and reigned as Alexander IV until 309 BCE when he got a terrible case of the assassins, probably. Um, good clarification for our purposes, yeah. No, uh, no real heirs. Episode two uh, is pointed out Caesar and Cleopatra's kid, his nickname was Caesarian. His full name was Ptolemy 15th Philpator Philmetor Caesar. So you can see why we didn't use that one. Uh, we try and we try and be, use 
simplified names in general just to keep everyone straight. Um, we mentioned that Caesar killed a lot of his enemies. He pardoned many as well. General rule of thumb is if you're a Roman politician, Caesar wanted to keep you alive, but non-Romans were dealt with brutal efficiency. Yeah. If we ever manage to do the Caesar series, which I have had on the voting before, and I would like to do, uh, we'll talk about that a little more. Episode 3. A lot of people thought we were giving Cleopatra way too much credit and outsized effect on Rome and Caesar. Um, and I'm just going to read the uh, what Bob sent me. So we, that is a conscious choice because this is a Cleopatra series. And with the differing interpretations, we wanted to go with the one that highlighted Cleopatra's role. If we were doing a Caesar series, we'd probably do it differently because history is, of course, not told one way. It is not one story. Um, and ours is a starting place. But since we were doing Cleopatra, not Caesar, we wanted to highlight some of the recent scholarship that suggests she did have a, a larger effect. Um, Bob says, not surprised by this. There's a lot, uh, a lot of people are very invested in the history of Caesar. In a lot of ways, this issue is explored in episode five. And like you said, this is a series about Cleopatra and not Caesar. The problem isn't so much changing the story, but instead looking at the same story from a different perspective. Regardless, there's a few things to keep in mind. Almost all Roman histories are propaganda, especially those written by and about Caesar and Octavian. It's the reason we have such a negative opinion of Caligula, for instance. Was he really that bad? That's certainly what his enemies wrote, but we'll never really know. Was Caesar really that magnificent? That's certainly what he said. I like this part. When you think about these ancient sources, it's often more useful to think of them as wrestling promos. They aren't necessarily committed to the truth, like we are. Second, instead of focusing on the propaganda that was produced, look at the actual historical results. Cleopatra elevates her role, Egypt's position, with little to no military power. She comes to nearly rule the Mediterranean with Antony. That's incredible. Finally, the sources written during this age were sexist, full stop. The scholars that used the original sources to write secondary sources in histories were also unapologetically sexist. So there's a little bit of, you know, trying to clear away that bias. Um, so th that's that's why we decided to go with that version, because it's Cleopatra. So we're highlighting the, the theories that are more uh, entwined with Cleopatra. And there's been a lot of re really cool recent scholarship on it. The statue Caesar had created was not in a temple solely for the gods, one commenter said, but also contained other Roman kings. So creating a statue of himself in the temple was not as contentious as, as the show portrayed. Yes, but those were dead kings that had been dead for quite a while. Um, and that also creates a little cover for him, right? Like, that temple is for the statue of gods. Oh, but there are kings there too. So it's okay for my statue to be there among the gods and kings. Other thing to note is that uh, the idea of him putting a statue among kings is pretty scary. Rome had a really poor relationship with monarchy and tended to fear its return. So even if it's not Caesar figuring himself as a god, it's also F Caesar figuring himself as a king, which is almost as bad. Um, another commenter mentioned, when Caesar seized control of the calendar, uh, it was misleading as, as we portrayed it because this was a key part of his duties on Pontif as Pontifex Maximus. The main change was from lunar to solar. Lunar to solar is a big change, right? Lunar is the more Roman style, solar is the more Egyptian. Like, Egypt is all about the sun. Um, and something can be someone's duty, but also be a major power grab. Like, it's technically in the U.S. president's power, for example, under circum circumstance, certain circumstances to adjourn Congress. Anyone actually doing that would absolutely be, you know, criticized as being a dictator, right? Um, the same thing as, you know, suspension of habeas corpus or, you know, things like that. There are a lot of powers that offices have that if they're exercised, people are going to be very, very unhappy about them. And like a big change like that would be a major one. Um, we still do stuff on the lunar calendar here in Hong Kong. Uh, that's why the, a lot of the holidays move. Uh, one commenter mentioned, Caesar was not assassinated on the floor of the Senate. The Senate building was being renovated. It was actually forbidden to bring weapons into the Senate since they weren't meeting at, but since they weren't meeting at the Senate, loophole. Not that the legality of that was going to stop a political coup, but still. Uh, that would be really great stuff for a Caesar series. Our scripts are only 1,500 words, and I wanted to use those 1,500 words on Cleopatra, not Caesar. So Senate floor was just, just uh, uh, faster. If we, were, if we were to do a Caesar series, Assassination of Caesar, that would 100% be part of it. Episode 4. Patron question from Hercules. 
When talking about the Battle of Actium, you said gold and silver was there for a triumphal parade if Cleo and Antony won the battle, yet I recall reading that the gold and silver was on the ships because they're trying to make a getaway, uh, but it got caught by Octavian and was forced to do battle. So which is it? So this is a little bit of a, a, a misunderstanding of the uh, narration, which might be my fault. I just mentioned that their, their ships were supposed to be incredibly resplendent. Uh, so to convey that, I said, it looks like they're on their way to a parade, not a battle, right? So, um, sorry for that confusion, but they did have a bunch of gold and silver aboard, but it was to pay off their political allies and uh, their potential allies and current allies. Uh, so, yeah, that's that. One person mentioned we showed Arsinoe being booed and crying, but in actuality, she won the Roman crowd over during the triumph, uh, and the crowd asked for execution to be stayed. So she won them over, but she won them over by the fact that she was so pathetic. Like, people felt sorry for her because she was weeping and, and uh, was clearly just in such a pathetic situation. Um, but also there would have been plenty of people calling for her head in the crowd. Uh, it was apparently quite a near-run thing. So, yeah, she wins them over, but it's not by her sparkling personality or anything. It's, it's by the fact that they feel very sorry for her. On the same note, people thought we were um, depicting Cleopatra as being sympathetic toward her sister, uh, at the triumph, which they felt was strange, given Cleopatra had Mark Antony execute her. Uh, no, she was depicted as uh, thinking about Arsinoe's experience and that it, that might happen to her, and how she was uh, frightened by that prospect and uh, felt terrible about that. Volks wanted to hear about Agrippa. So, uh, Octavian has a general called Agrippa. He is the one who wins the Battle of Actium. Uh, we don't mention him in the series. Uh, he's really interesting, not so much because of his military career, which is also interesting, but as a major uh, builder and architect and sponsor of public works. So he's the one who refurbishes Rome's aqueducts and does a lot of public baths and cleans out the sewer system, uh, has a large network of uh, roads in Gaul that are, uh, that are named after him. He charts a survey of the empire, builds theaters, but he's most known for building the original Parthenon, not the one that's around now, the one that was before, the one that's standing now is uh, from the time of Hadrian. Um, and he was said to have uh, moved into Rome when it was a city of brick and made it a city of marvel. marvel. So he's, he's an interesting guy. Um, yeah, he's also Caligula's grandfather and Nero's great-grandfather. Episode 5. Uh, when we talk about Cleopatra's statue being pulled through Rome and people think that it's, her, it's actually her body, um, I chose to portray the statue in white marble rather than painted. It would have been painted, but I worried that the way the narration went and because of our show's art style, I worried that people wouldn't be able to distinguish, the viewer wouldn't be able to distinguish between a statue and just how we draw Cleopatra. Um, and I thought it just might look a little strange. Um, so I knowingly said, like, let's just have it be white marble so that it's clear it's a statue, not her, um, so that there's no visual confusion. I'll just talk about it in lies. But yes, all the statues in Rome, they're not white marble, right? They're painted. Uh, but that was a choice for clarity in that specific interest. Uh, people wanted to know about the asp. How true is the asp story likely to be? It's a major point of debate. Uh, there are scholars who think that she poisoned herself, that a snake was not involved at all. Uh, there's also some question of, like, what did asp mean? Was asp just a generalized uh, word for a venomous snake at that time and in, in that area? Um, or uh, people would just say asps or whatever, like North, North uh, Egyptian or North African serpent. A lot of people, a lot of scholars have said it's more likely to have been a cobra than an asp. An asp, it doesn't, the venom doesn't kill you all that fast. Um, and what is described sounds more like a cobra. In the end, it doesn't really matter. Like, the mechanics don't matter. What matters is that it happened and that how people remembered it. And we, you know, we needed to have that, that ASP story um, to build on in episode five um, and talk about legacy. In, the ancient sources, say, are pretty clear about Snake, um, but there have been some questions. All right, coming up on Extra History, next time we have End of the Samurai. Oh, I'm so excited about this one. I'll try and hold hold back all the, all the things I want to say about it, but we're talking about the Meiji Restoration, but it's more about the violence surrounding the Meiji Restoration. If your world history textbook said that this was a bloodless revolution, 
it's a bloodless revolution in comparison to other revolutions. Like, considering the number of changes that happened, you know, scholars are like, well, okay, a lot of people died, but it's amazing that, like, it's not French Revolution, Napoleonic Wars, number of people who died, right? Like, it's incredible that it's, you know, a couple of 10,000 rather than, like, 100,000. Uh, so we're going into political violence surrounding the Meiji Restoration, the Boshin War, the Satsuma Rebellion, and uh, specifically class reform involving the samurai. Uh, so we're not going to be doing too much on like public education and like that kind of thing. Um, then we are going to do Saladin, which is really cool. I just finished writing these. Uh, I had a lot of fun with him. He's a fascinating historical character. And what just won the topic vote was Teddy Roosevelt Trust Buster. So we're going to be talking about the breakup of Standard Oil. I just finished like my first stage of research on these and I'm really excited to get writing them because it is a really cool story with a lot of relevance to today. And now it's time for Ibn Battuta's side trip special super size Halloween edition. I wanted to talk about our one-off on the Beast of Jabodon, um, partially because I actually wrote that one. Um, and also I'm utterly obsessed with that as a topic. I've been very into it since I was a teenager. And normally we don't do recommended readings for a one-off, but because there's on really only one scholarly book on this topic in English, I really wanted to give it a shout out. Monsters of the Gévaudan, The Making of a Beast by J.M. Smith. This is a fantastic book. It reads uh, like a novel. It's very, very interesting with stuff about the early French press, uh, village folklore, the Seven Years' War. I highly, highly recommend it. We used it, you know, we used it to do our episode. Um, and it's, it's great. I just really, really think this is awesome. We took a very skeptical view of the beast. There are people that say it was an escaped lion. I don't think that's particularly likely. The, this part of France is real rural, even today. So it's a little strange to think that someone would have like a lion in a menagerie somewhere that uh, would get out. Same thing with a hyena. Just not like a, a place where that feels like it would happen. Um, it's possible that there was a wolf-dog hybrid. Uh, that is a thing that is a thing that happens. But you know, Jam Smith points out that there are just these rashes of wolf attacks where twenty people are killed at a time. You know, every decade or couple of decades in France at this point. And this one, just due to the special circumstances surrounding it, ended up kind of spiraling up into a big deal in the media. And it's good to remember that when you look at pictures of the beast, these are not, you know, witness uh, illustrations. Sometimes, at best, it's someone in Paris hearing what someone described uh, the beast as and then creating a visual representation. Um, but this is just like a fascinating, fascinating book. Um, and I just wanted to point out, we did take a very skeptical uh, viewpoint of it, saying like, ah, it's just a bunch of wolves. Um, and you know, it's being interpreted through a filter of religious terror and uh, and village folklore who, you know, when you say shining eyes, in rural France that means werewolf, right? So when people are like, the beast has shining eyes, what they're saying is like, it's a werewolf. And you hear a lot of, when you listen to podcasts or um, YouTube videos or, or even like History Channel stuff on it, there's frequent a lot of frequent, says like, oh, well, it had this kind of puff of, hair on its tail, so that sounds like a lion and a ridge on its back, and they leave out the stuff of people saying, like, well, it also, like, talks and walk, walks on its hind legs and can charm bullets, you know, so that it has, like, an, like a, a bullets can strike it and do, do no good. So, yeah, uh, sometimes there's, like, a little bit of specific selection of information to make it sound like one animal or another, when probably it's just being seen through this, this prism of, of folklore and the media and... Uh, that's the argument of this book, that it's a created beast rather than, uh, rather than specifically like any escaped animal. Um, but I just think it's a, such an interesting thing. I, I almost wanted to do like four or five episodes on it. When I was doing the one-off, I was like, oh no, it would be cool to just keep, keep doing these. Um, but I, I really encourage you to read more about it, specifically this book. Uh, it's absolutely spectacular. Thanks a lot. See you next time. Uh, have a you already had a happy Halloween, hopefully. Stay safe, see you next time.
Did you all know that Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Gunnar Clovis, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One were all legendary patrons? Thanks, everyone.